Well, the organizers have uh, kindly agreed to allow me to say a few remarks um, at the beginning about the Ronald Coase Institute. I'm Mary Shirley. I'm the president of the Ronald Coase Institute. And I'm going to uh, very briefly give you some sense of our background and what we do uh, before I turn the floor over to our English next speaker. Um, the roots of the Ronald Coase Institute really go back to 1996 to a, a conference on property rights that was organized in St. Louis by Lee Benham and Alexandra Benham at, the, at Washington University in St. Louis. And I, at that time, was still working for the World Bank Research Department doing research on water with, uh, Ronald, with uh, Roger Dole and others. And I presented my paper at this conference to a lot of, a small group of people who um, really were thinking very much the same way, including Ronald Coase, Douglas North, John Nye, and others. And after this meeting ended, a group of us, um, Lee Benham, Alexander Benham, Claude Bernard, and I decided to start an academic society, which we call the International Society for New Institutional Economics, ISNI. And we had the brilliant idea of asking Ronald to be our first president, which he agreed to do. Um, he came to the first meeting and he told the, the group at ISNI what their mission was, which he said, and I quote, to transform economics. And if you know Ronald, that's pretty characteristic. Um, and indeed, ISNI was a big success, I think. It, uh, it attracted a large following, very loyal from all over the world. But in 2000, I had a conversation with Ronald Coase, and he told me that he, he wasn't satisfied. He felt that it was not a, we weren't doing enough for young scholars, that forming an academic society was really not enough to help young scholars, particularly young scholars in poorer countries. And he talked to me about the Castle Traveling Scholarship that he got uh, famously back um, from the University of London and that allowed him to travel in the United States during the Great Depression in 1931 and 1932. And as he said, I believe briefly on his video, that was when he uh, met with a lot of businessmen and had an opportunity to talk about their problems and formulate the ideas that led later, of course, to the nature of the firm. And how grateful he was for that opportunity and how little support it really did take to help young people get started. He also talked about his faith in younger people to be able to see things clearly. Uh, he said on his video that uh, the nature of the firm was an undergraduate essay, and he really um, pushed for the idea of giving more support to younger scholars. So based on that inspiration and with Ronald's help, uh, Lee Benham and Alexandra Benham and I started the Ronald Coase Institute in 2000 with Ronald as our research director. We've been uh, very fortunate to have an outstanding board of directors, including Douglas North, Kenneth Arrow, uh, most recently Eleanor Ostrom, and also Gary Livecraft, Lee Benham, Claude Menard, and to have Alexandra Benham as the secretary of the board. We've also benefited from a lot of established scholars, many of them in this room, who have volunteered their time as faculty uh, to our workshops. Um, our focus has been inspired by some of the uh, statements of Ronald, and in particular when he said, it makes little sense for economists to discuss the process of exchange without specifying the institutional setting within which the trading takes place since this affects the incentives to produce and the cost of transacting. We believe in the Institute that local scholars often have a comparative advantage in studying the institutional framework in their own countries, particularly to understand norms of behavior in informal institutions. And uh, they also are frequently more influential than outsiders over local opinion. They are frequently young professors, so they may be training the next generation of policymakers, and often they are the ones who may end up as advisors to the president or uh, the president of central banks. But often these young scholars lack not only funding, but training, support, mentors, collaborators. They, they frequently will feel very isolated. And if any of you have ever been to countries and, and seen how things operate in universities in developing countries or in research institutes, you know as well as I that all too often all the rewards go to the head of the institute or the heads 
the important people in the university, and the younger scholars are isolated and they are starved for funds uh, and for support, and even for feedback frequently. And on top of that, in many countries, of course, there's a lot of danger associated or risk associated with taking positions that are against uh, established orthodoxy or established elites. So our goal in the Coase Institute is to try to break through that impasse, to help those young scholars feel part of a supportive network, and to give them the mentoring and feedback that they lack. One way we do this is through workshops. We hold five-day workshops, and a group of us, in fact, are leaving this conference to go to our next workshop, which will be our 15th workshop in Xiamen, China. Um, and today, we've trained over 300 young scholars uh, from 55 different countries. Besides these workshops, we also hold research conferences. We've had three here at the University of Chicago, and Ronald has attended all of them and spoken to the young people. We also help have a network, I mean a, a, a website that provides a lot of information on institutional economics and also a bibliography and background on Ronald Coe's. Uh, we maintain, as I mentioned, a supportive network that we um, involve our scholars in and where they can find uh, like-minded people to talk to. And, in addition to that, um, we do sometimes give small grants, uh, but we're, uh, that's not our main focus. So I, I think there was a lot of conversation in the, part, in the morning sessions about the impact and influence of Ronald Coase's ideas. And I just wanted to fill you in on what we're doing, which is another way in which Ronald has extended his influence to hundreds of scholars, often who are struggling in the, uh, in the field in their own countries. And uh, we expect that that, too, will go on to have an enormous impact in the future. So now let me uh, introduce the man who needs no introduction, who will uh, say a few word opening remarks. Um, I'm sure all of you know uh, Douglas North. Uh, he's had a huge influence on me and many people in this room. Um, of course, he's, he's teaching still at Washington University in St. Louis and um, is a Nobel laureate as well. I, uh, Richard told me not to give people uh, CVs or backgrounds, and um, certainly in the case of Ronald, that, that I mean, in the case of Douglas, that would be redundant. So please, Douglas. I'm not sure what I'm doing here. When Mary asked me to give a talk, I said, "Well, you know all the things that I'm that I, I'm going to say." And she said, well, you'll be at least a humorous appeal, but all the humor went out this morning, so I can't possibly compete with that this afternoon. Uh, but I thought I would talk to you for a minute about what I know about the operation of the Coast Institute, since I've been involved in a number of them and uh, given talks at a number of them in various parts of the world. Because I think that uh, Mary described it de in, 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 in broad detail but I want to say some specific things. When you go to the Coase Institute, first of all, the people who have participated in them have been first rate. They've been good scholars who have taken sound advice and particularly drawn from their, the countries of their origin and applied the, the uh, material from uh, institutional analysis to problems not only in their own country but in other countries as well. The result has been that we have a group of young people now that, as Mary says, more than 300 uh, who have participated in, who are now beginning to influence the structure of organization and institutional analysis in their own country. The result is, I think, a very impressive tribute, a tribute not only to, to Mary, who has been the founding thing, but also to Lee and Alexander Benham down there, who played a major role in it all the way along. But it's played a big role, and I can testify that in countries where I've been, whether it's in China or in other parts of the world, uh, the Coase Institute has played a major role in shaping uh, the thinking of young people, and gradually, since these young people are moving up uh, the ladder to become leaders in their own country, making a, 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 a beginning for a major play in influencing what's going to go on in the, next, in the next years, all over the world. So 
So I think that Goethe's Institute is an immense achievement that uh, Mary has played such a big role in, and I think it's just great. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing more, more not only from my young colleague Sebastian, who's going to talk about some of the things I do, but some of the other young people who participate in the Goethe Institute. Thank you.
because of preconditions you will find uh, there's some land that is more valuable in economically and hence it's more likely that people will pay the, the cost of um, define better property rights for, for, that, for that land and hence if you then correlate uh, property rights in, in, in any dimension in which you can measure them with outcomes, there's going to be simultaneity, right? If it's the land that has the highest value, the one that uh, the property rights are better, better defined. But then you might say, well, let's exploit not that type of difference in land rights, but the type of land, uh, difference that came from intervention, where governments go and try to do something to change the definition of property rights, and some people get into that problem as another thumb. Well, but in general, that's also endogenous because that's related to wealth, political connections, where you are in the country, and so on and so forth. So it is a difficult problem. So, of course, uh, I just the first, the first solution would be in, in one of those programs. Uh, sort of try to do an experiment, but right? no one done that, so uh, I'm going to skip that, but it's not, it's possible, right, with the, 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 at least in development economics, there's, there's, there's a grow emphasis on, on experimentation, so you know, it, it might be that soon we, we get this kind of evidence, but not having that, we should, the first thing we, we want to do is to mimic that, and, and that now we call natural experiments, and I'm going to talk a bit about some of them, but, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to uh, emphasize one case, but, but in the papers we, we, we go over the, the ones that are available. In this, in what will happen in a natural experiment? What happen something similar to an experiment, but uh, the experiment, the, the researcher is not the one that manipulates the treatment. It's something that naturally happens, but statistically have similar properties. Or more often, uh, most papers have relied more on quasi-experiments to deal with this, which basically is the use of or uh, relying on fixed effects, uh, exploiting either geographical variability uh, within households, so households may, may own plots in, under different property rights, or over time, exploiting the timing of programs that have been uh, introduced. So basically, what we try to do here is to take stock of this literature to see what we learn, um, uh, what are the effects, and, and maybe through what channels they operate. So basically, how property rights affect efficiency of resource allocation? Well, by mainly two broad, I mean, we can open these two categories and, and go inside them. Uh, if I have time, I'll do it. But for now, let me say, by limiting expropriation and by facilitating exchange, OK? And within facilitating exchange, there's been recently, in the last 10 to 15 years, one uh, particular channel that got a lot of attention, which is the collateral. The fact that this idea that uh, credit markets uh, use collateral extensively for its operation, and, and, and once basically the poor may have land that is not, uh, their property rights not well defined, they cannot use as collateral and that uh, impedes access to credit and the creation of wealth in society. So I'm, I'm going to look at that into detail. Uh, in, as what, but that's not the only channel through which property rights will facilitate the exchange, but it's the one that the literature focuses most. So in other channels, the thing is we, we might not even have evidence. The first thing to to notice, and, and in, in, in the paper we, we, we illustrate this with, with a general model, which we has partial, or, or we, we hope that we are going to get also to general equilibrium effects, is that there's going to be heterogeneous effects, right? So, so the, this, you will have the literature out there that the first thing papers will try to do is try to deal with endogeneity. And so they will go outside, find for this quasi, or look for this quasi-experiment, and they will try to exploit that, maximizing what people call in, in statistics internal validity. Of course, that will somehow impair uh, external validity, and, and that's one trade-off. But there's something that then you have to uh, take into account when you look at the results, okay? So there's going to be a heterogeneous effect across, across studies because, the, let's say, the status quo of property right in each study 
uh, is going to be different. So, for example, if you go to Ghana, there's going to be certain rights that might follow the matrilic system, or if you go to Madagascar, even still in sub-Saharan Africa, the property rights will be uh, less determined by political connections, and, and hence the status quo is different. And so when, when you change property rights, even if, if you do it in similar ways in Ghana and Madagascar, uh, the effects that you might, might expect are different. So also the institutional context of the country or the region will matter a lot because in, in, in places where uh, still, I mean, in, in a sense, uh, all this is, is, is about reducing transaction costs and if dealing with the state and uh, a state enforcement of property rights has transaction costs that are quite similar to uh, whatever is in the status quo, well, that's not going to make a difference, okay? So, more part, and this is very general in, to property rights studies, I will say, in general, but once you get to land, rural versus, use of, uh, versus urban use of land makes a whole difference because in rural areas, people will, will use the land as an input of production, and hence, uh, if altering the property right affects the way they use the land, that will affect their earnings uh, directly, while in, in, in urban areas, that's not going to happen. It's, well, it might happen, but, 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 not, but not as directly as. So one possibility is, because it will happen if it facilitates this change, because it might, it might go through the collateral effect, so if people get credit because of that. Or it might happen if, basically, but this, I, we have to, I have to be careful, if basically there are some complementarities in the use of labor in the sense between market and protected assets. So if that happens, uh, if, if families are constrained at that margin, it might be that then uh, by reducing the risk of expropriation, people can li liberalize uh, labor that it was used for protection and send that to the market. It might happen, I'm not sure how relevant it is. So uh, it, it also will depend on the wealth of the beneficiaries because if people is very, very poor, uh, even they're not going to be constrained in the credit market by not having collateral. So, so and that might be what's going on in, in all these studies, uh, as you see when I get to, to summarize more results. And, and, and then the demand and supply of credit, uh, again, will matter, um, and the mobility of population, okay? And, and whether multiple plots are used as well, because when, when financial markets uh, are, are not available, uh, people may use multiple plots for insurance, and then if you sort of go and improve on the property right from, but that came at the cost of uh, privatizing land and so people stop using multiple plots, well, they, they will lose the insurance aspect of that. Okay, so these preconditions will differ in, in, in many areas, but one that clearly uh, is, is, is very obvious that we should focus first uh, as an started is between rural and urban areas. Therefore, I'm gonna look separately at, at, at rural and urban studies. So again, uh, because I don't have a lot of time, I cannot go into detail into each paper, but let me say that there's some papers, uh, uh, more actually in rural areas than in urban, that have tried to address, uh, from, at least from a statistical point of view, in each, in each area, endogeneity and have came with results, okay? The first one is Besley, uh, well, it's not 55, sorry, it's 95. Um, in the Journal of Political Economy, and basically he, in Ghana, uh, and, he, and this is interesting to illustrate the problem of endogeneity. He has two areas in Ghana, one is Wasa and the other is Angola. In Ghana, he finds that more secure property rights led to more investment, but in Angola, he finds no effect. But he was doing, he was reanalyzing a, a, a data collected by the World Bank and the World Bank paper uh, that did not address endogeneity found exactly the opposite result, right? But they found that in Ghana there was no effect, and in Angola there was a big effect. 
Uh, so that illustrates how severe is, is the problem of, of endogeneity. More recently, again in the Journal of Political Economy, Udry and Goldstein exploit also in Ghana uh, political connections, because as I say, in this, uh, this matrilineal system of uh, uh, assigning property rights, uh, having political connection will ensure you that you will uh, uh, have keep having access to the same pl plots you are exploiting, so that's going to affect following. So if you, sp if you have a longer time horizon, you're more likely to, to invest in follow, and, and that will increase productivity and, and reduce output. And they, they find large effects, to, to my knowledge, this is the study that finds the largest effect uh, ever in terms of the effects of ill-defined property rights on land, on productivity and investment. Well, that, that's, that's kind of a, a papers in Africa. There's a paper in, in the American Economic Review by, by Jacobi in 2002 where they look at the risk of expropriation uh, and, again, investment in, in, and productivity in land, and they find also effects. And this, I will say, just for the sake of brevity, is confirmed in studies by Van, Bandiera, Alston, et al., Gary, Leibekap, and Dan Lueck. Uh, he talked a bit uh, as an introduction of this morning about this paper, uh, Roselli and Swinon, for, for different areas, Latin America, Eastern Europe, um, yeah, that. Okay, so one thing is that you can take from this paper is, yeah, better defined property rights in urban areas, it all, always affects investment. More, well, better defined property rights in one sense uh, uh, stimulate investment, which uh, is, is, is uh, as we expected, but that, then th none of these exploit any policy variation. It's not something that we can change politically. So if you go to, so let's say, the Ghana study, which finds the larger effect, it's not that we can say, well, people have to have, how do we're going to get these more secure uh, property rights, not through basically stimulating their political connections. Anyway, you cannot do for everyone. So, so basically, you want to introduce a reform there like, for example, land titles or registration, that you, you will hope will provide these more secure property rights and, um, and, and get the same results. The problem is that there's few studies looking at that, and the one in, that explicitly look at the land title program in Madagascar find very little effects on, on investment, some effects on, on, on la, land price values, and, and once you, 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 you basically uh, take into account and do the, the sort of the cost-benefit analysis, because of course enacting and, and legalizing titles has a cost, they find uh, that only uh, large plots uh, are worth titling, and, and those are not the typical situation, at least in sub-Saharan Africa, so you will conclude maybe that the status quo once you take into account the transaction cost of enacting the institution of titling, it's not that inefficient. But I don't think we can generalize from one study that, given the large effect, given the fact that the other, other papers uh, exploiting a different, uh, different variations in proper secure property rights have found much larger effects. So one thing that we want to do is to try to to generalize this cost-benefit analysis for, for more studies in, in this paper, sort of do a kind of meta-analysis of that. Uh, but then again, uh, there's another study where they, they look at rural uh, land, a huge program of titling in rural areas in Vietnam, which is mo much more promising in terms of the cost-benefit analysis. Okay. So once you, we move to, to uh, land titling in urban areas, here, here the situation is quite different. So it's clear that land is very scarce in, in urban areas. It, it's, it's valuable. So the reason for not having well-defined property rights is not that it's not valuable, it's, as it might happen in some uh, rural areas. Uh, but as I said before, there's not going to be productivity effects or earnings effects that go directly by the just improving secure property rights. So if it happens, it happens through indirect channels. So we explicitly have to focus on access to credit and labor market here, outcomes. 
So I'm first going to talk about a bunch of papers by, by uh, myself and co-authors, and then by Erika Phil, uh, who exploits the large titling program in Peru, that actually was the program that the Soto promoted when he was related to, to the government. Uh, so this is exploiting a natural experiment in Buenos Aires. So uh, how, how much time do I have? Five minutes, good. So uh, exploiting this, basically, let me, uh, we look at the effects of land title on investment, how whole structure, human capital, credit earnings, and, and belief of squatter. I'm not going to talk about belief today because of lack of time. It's very interesting. But let me talk about the, the same similar outcomes I was considering before. So how, how this naturally, uh, well, in one minute, basically, there's a group of squatters in the early 80s, they, they moved to a piece of land, typical, uh, this typical of, of uh, urban areas in developing countries, mainly because the credit markets don't work for the poor, right? And so basically, through the process of development, they, they move from rural areas to urban areas because there's better labor market prospects there. They, but they squat land and, and they informally settle because they cannot uh, buy, buy houses or using credit. Uh, once once they, they, they move there, the, it turns out that the land didn't belong to the state as, as they, they do. It belongs to certain different owners. Um, and so the, the, the government passed a law to expropriate the owners. And, and, and then if the owners surrender the land, they, they were, were going to transfer the titles to to the squatters, then the squatters have to pay over 10 years back to the government the, the cost, the fiscal cost of that. And, and, but what happened is that some owners surrendered the land and some owners didn't surrender the land. And so then we have this, this situation where some, some people is, is received land titles and others didn't in a very small piece of land that is, is, is really homogeneous. And one thing that we show in the paper is that those who received land and those who didn't have the, there's no observable difference in land or observable difference in the uh, in, in the characteristics of the uh, original squatter. Okay. So looking at that oh, in in this series of papers, we first look at the uh, uh, obvious. Uh, well, I would say because following the logic of reasoning that I've, I've been developing so far, the obvious will be access to credit and earnings. And we, we find very small effects on credit, formal credit I'm talking, and, and no effects on earnings after uh, 13 to uh, 17 years. So basically, let me say that we did a, a study collecting data uh, in 2003, and the first two papers I mentioned were uh, done using this data. And so once you don't find effects on credit and earnings, you might say, well, then there's, there's going to be no effect um, on welfare, well, other than maybe physical investment in the house. It might be that they invest more in the house because, and, and, and this is because basically a pro, more secure property rights facilitate the exchange. So one thing that we know from this market is that if you, if you, if you don't have a title you, and you, you invest in the land, then if you want to sell, you have to sell at a high discount. So by affecting how the markets work, it, it, it still stimulates investment. And what we find is that these squatters invested 40% more in the house, sort of 13 uh, years after uh, we visit uh, them. Um, but even after four or five years, because I don't want to, I don't have time to enter into detail, but we have an early treatment group and a late treatment group because of uh, what happened through, through time here. But then what we find is that there were some effects in household structure that were not, were not part of this discussion that might be important in, 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 in other areas. Once you, 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 you give property rights to someone in the house, he might ex exercise to, uh, to, to decide who may is allowed to live in the house and who doesn't. So the houses that were not titled is, are places where you find a lot of other people residing there. Two minutes. Okay. So, and then this was a small adjustment in fertility. Well, some adjustment in fertility. So then, funded by the by the Ronald Coase Institute, and, and I thank again once more for that. 
we revisit this household because in the in the 2003, the children of these houses were all uh, at the age of finishing at most primary school, and so. Even the poor go to primary school in Latin American urban areas. So we find some difference in the quality, in the human capital accumulation of the children, but they were very small. They were like 0.4 years of education. Maybe it's not small, but it wasn't something that you can say, well, that's, that's a splash. So in the follow-up survey, we, we were able to, to, to test uh, the difference for the probability of finishing in secondary school, and there we find much larger effects of the order of 20, 25 points higher, which means basically that this household moved from the typical po poor household completion rates to the uh, middle class completion rate in the country. And we also find some effects on health, which are, are not surprising because they are quite related to housing, though there's not many studies in housing. Uh, as, as So this just it's the typical difference between a house that got the titles and one that didn't that appear in, in the Wall Street Journal that ran an article following our paper. Um, and then just to finish, then uh, Erika Phil uh, also did a very nice study in, in Lima where uh, ex exploiting panel data on that, on that program intervention, she finds also similar and large effects on investment of the order of 60%. But then she finds also labor supply effects, which we don't. However, uh, she doesn't find much effect on credit either, so, 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 so there's more to say about labor supply, but I won't have much time. So my part in thought, just to finish, is that secure property rights in land seems to improve investment everywhere. There's less evidence about the collateral effect. I will say this at this point, there's very little on that. In rural areas, land title might not always be cost effective, uh, though in urban areas seems to be. Uh, and in urban areas, there might be important effects on household structure and capital uh, accumulation. Our next uh, paper is going to be um, uh, by Jiafen Chen and Ximin Liao, and that's on uh, why the entry regulation of China's mobile phone manufacturing industry collapsed, uh, the impact of technological innovation or institutional transformation. Uh, thank you, Mary. Uh, um, thank, you, thank you, the organizer of this conference. It's our honor to uh, share this interesting story happening in China uh, with you. Uh, basically, we are trying to answer an uh, interesting uh, question. Uh, why the Chinese government uh, uh, would uh, stop their license regulation into the uh, mobile phone manufacturing industry in China? Uh, this is the outline of our, our talk. First, we will describe the, uh, the brief history of this license regulation. Uh, second, we will talk about uh, technological innovation happened in 2004, which has changed the whole situation. Uh, then we will talk about the rise of battery phones, which was caused by this new technology. Finally, we will, we will, we will describe uh, the impact of this new technology and the battery phones upon the industry and the uh, regula regulation system. Uh, about, oh, sorry, uh, here are some actors of, of our story. We have a central government who have invested the power to the regulator, and, we have, and then the regulator issued some uh, license to the uh, mobile phone manufacturers. Most of, most of them are the state-owned enterprises. And uh, here is the uh, uh, history of this, this uh, license system. About 11 years ago, in 1998, the Chinese government initiated a license regulation, and no enterprises was allowed to produce mobile phones unless they first get, get a license from the regulator. And in the, in the following year, the regulator issued about 50 uh, licenses, and most of them are the uh, 
state-owned enterprises um, and failed, uh, failed to the regulator. And this system was very strict uh, because we find that in the following five or six years, no more licenses were issued. And this has created a large monopoly rent for the uh, license holders. And some, most of them didn't uh, produce mobile phones by themselves. Instead, they just make, make profit by leasing the license to other enterprises. And this system was, cri short, was harshly criticized by the, uh, the uh, private enterprises. But uh, in year 2004, 2004, the regulator said they, they will keep, keep this, uh, they will stick to this uh, uh, license uh, system. However, on, only one year later, they relaxed this license regulation, and uh, some, uh, some uh, more and more enterprises got the got license. And uh, soon, in two, two years later, in 2007, they, they formally re, uh, abolished this system. So, so what happened during this, this period? We found the uh, most possible reason is a new technology you know, innovation happened in 2004. This is an integrated chip invented by a Taiwan company. This chip has, has integrated all the basic software of mobile phones into one, one chip. And it greatly reduced the production cost of mobile phones. And after this innovation, the, the, product, the, the market price of the, the phones fell about 50, uh, sorry, 80 percent. Uh, and uh, pr producing mobile phone became much easier than before. And so soon, soon after this uh, technology was introduced into mainland China, thousands of uh, mobile phone factories appeared in southern China, most of them located in Shenzhen city. And uh, they produce numerous uh, phones, which was called bedded phones. Here are some pictures of these phones. Uh, you can see that the, their appearance was very, uh, were very fancy, and uh, mo and more importantly, they were very cheap, much cheaper than the legal cell phones. And some of them or even have uh, fashion functions or or appearance. Uh, just like the uh, famous brand like uh, iPhones. So it is imaginable that soon after, uh, soon after that, uh, these bedded phones flooded the domestic market and uh, uh, many poor people could afford uh, such bedded phones. We can see that even the uh, beggar on the street can make a call and uh, the, pic the right picture is a uh, man have to climb up the tree to make a call because the, in the remote area, the, the signal was very sick, weak. So it is very uh, interesting that nearly in the, in the same year, we found that uh, the, there was a large scale of financial failure of, of all the, nearly all the state-owned uh, mobile phone producers. Here is one of the biggest uh, enterprises at that time. We can, we can see that uh, from 2004, it, its profit began to fall, and in the next year, it suffered a large loss. And in 2007, just in the same year when the license was, system was abolished, this corporation exited, exited from, the, from the market. And the situation of another enterprise is, was very similar. And the, we can see the critical year, critical time is 2004. With, besides the budget phones, we also considered the other possible explanation for the failure of this state-owned enterprises. For example, could it be the, the market situation was going down during that time? Uh, not likely. This is a number of the customers of mobile phones in the past 10 years. We, 
we can see that uh, it was uh, keep going, going up very rapidly. And we also considered the computation from, from a board. Here, here is the number of mobile phones uh, imported into China during the past 10 years. We found that in year, year 2004 and five, the, the number was re reduced uh, obviously. So it could not be the competition from abroad. So here is the, here is the logic of this story. The new technology re sharply reduced the production cost of mobile phone and thus caused the numerous illegal uh, producers flooding into this market. And it, it became much difficult for the regulator to enforce its reg regulation. So, uh, the li so holding a license itself could not bring monopoly rents for this this uh, state-owned enterprises because the market was very, very competitive. So the li license is, has no value, which may explain why the, will, the interest group didn't, uh, didn't uh, keep this system going on. Uh, but this is, is not, this is not the whole story because we still have another two main actors in this, in this story. The one is the local government because most, nearly all the uh, illegal uh, enterprises was in the Shenzhen, South China. And the regulator is in Beijing. It didn't have enough enforcement uh, force in the, in the uh, southern China. So it had to rely on the local government to enforce the regulation. However, the local government has, must have their own uh, interest. The fatted phone was developed very, rapid, very rapidly and it increased the employment opportunities and re tax revenues for the local government. And we also have another uh, actor, it is the network operators. So we, the interesting question is why the network operators didn't, didn't simply reject the, the fatted phones connect from connecting to the network. So we, we think the most possible reason is that they, they also get benefited from the fatted phones. Here is the data of the total profit of the network uh, service providers in China. We can see that in the, in the past 10 years, it, the profit was kept going up. And uh, if after two, uh, 2004, uh, the the, the profit was even uh, increasing with a more rapid uh, uh, speed. Another question is why the central government didn't, uh, re didn't force the uh, operator, network operators to uh, support the regulator. Um, we have not found the, the uh, definite answer, but uh, a possible reason is that the the network operators are subject to, directly subjected to the central government, not uh, subject to the uh, authority of, uh, of the uh, regulator. And uh, its revenue was, uh, were much bigger than the uh, manufacturers. Uh, we have two network operators uh, in China. Uh, the China Mobile is the largest one. Uh, here is an example. In 2000, 2007, the China mobile uh, profit was about 200 billion Chinese yuan, while the, the birth company, who, who is the largest, who was the largest uh, mobile phone manufacturers uh, in China, uh, its profit was only 6 million Chinese yuan. So the, we can see the profits of the China mobile is much bigger than the, the bird. And uh, there's, there was only about 50 uh, uh, manufacturers like Bird in China at that time. So we, can, so we guess that the central government we, may have to balance the interest of the, these different uh, groups. So here's, here's our, our uh, brief summary. We think there are, there are maybe two uh, possible reasons for the for the abolishment of this uh, license uh, regulation system. The first is that new technology has 
sharply reduced the production cost and increased the enforcement cost of the uh, regulator. And another reason is there, there are conflicts of the interest between different government agencies in China. And these two, two factors may have caused the collapse of this, this whole system. Thank you. I might add that this is a work in progress, and there are a lot of um, people in the audience who are expert in this field who might uh, be interested in lending a hand to the um, two authors in, um, in pushing this work further. Um, so our next speaker and our final speaker is Lennon Choi, um, who is at the Polytechnic University in Hong Kong. He's going to present his paper on uh, housing as durable lemons uh, and under different structures of property rights. Lennon. And also, Professor No, for inviting me to attend this uh, important event. And it only takes me about 15 hour flight from Hong Kong to here, and there's such thing as jet lag. So I woke up at 3 a.m. this morning, and now it's um, 5 a.m. in Hong Kong. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm doing good. So I hope I can do my job. So, so this paper concerns about lemon. So you see, Professor Ko says, very puzzling about lemon, uh, which in the US, uh, you are referring to a uh, product of inferior, uh, inferior quality or product with uh, defects, um, which is uh, usually uh, uh, known, uh, the problem is known by the seller, while it is uh, very difficult for the buyer to discern. So given this uh, information asymmetry problem, that uh, the seller, used to overprice the lemon. So this paper actually want to address the questions that uh, under the common law doctrine of the less the buyer beware or the careful emptor. So it always paid the seller to conceal all the information and overprice the lemon. So uh, this is, uh, uh, we refer the property right to information is assigned to the seller. So we want to ask, uh, how about if we have another legal institution of which uh, the seller, uh, of which uh, the let the seller beware principle uh, prevails. So would this uh, overpricing behavior would be different? Uh, uh, would it be more expensive or less expensive for, for, for the lemon? So we're so lucky that we have a natural experiment uh, in Hong Kong's housing market, uh, where uh, we got a project that the housing developer is going to put up a massive development project in Hong Kong where the government is actually planning to build a highway, uh, actually straightening uh, through the development, which was, by the time, not known to the general public. However, it is uh, completely known by the housing developer, because uh, when you just check the restrictive covenant of the government lease, you sign uh, every conditions on the government leases, asking the, the developer to reserve area for the building of this highway project. So, in Hong Kong, uh, we have the, this uh, sales of uncompleted units or pre-sales arrangement that the housing developer, they can sell off the unit before completion. So there's a problem that uh, because of this uh, peculiarity uh, of the pre-sales market, that the buyer actually cannot inspect the property before they sign, uh, they, uh, they sign the contract. So the less the buyer beware principle, unfortunately, would not be applied. So instead, uh, the government has imposed uh, certain rules uh, of the let the seller beware uh, principle uh, in the pre-sales market. So uh, we have this uh, natural experiment that actually the housing developer were uh, 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 selling the lemons uh, under this uh, let the seller beware principle. Well, well, after completion of the project, some of these uh, future lemons was resold in the secondary market, where the let the buyer be rare principle was prevails. So this is uh, the floor plan uh, for the subject development, where you see it's a very typical residential development in Hong Kong. You see there's a lot of high rise uh, apartment building putting up on a, uh, what we call a, a massive shopping uh, arcade. And the housing developer actually didn't tell uh, the buyer uh, back to this time that there's going to have a highway, uh, public highway to be built. Actually, uh, 
uh, struggling through the whole development. So, uh, which is uh, indicating the uh, red line, and this red line is uh, superimposed by me, but uh, not by the developer. So here is uh, the durable lemon, you can see. So the, actually, this, uh, you can see a, a, a highway uh, getting inside the massive uh, shopping arcade, where uh, the developer, when they build uh, this uh, development project, they actually has concealed the hole, the back hole, the buyer actually do not see the back hole. So they conceal the back hole as if uh, there's no highway to be built in a few years' time. So what you can see is that uh, those apartment units uh, above uh, the highway uh, would be severely suffer from the traffic noise and problems of so on. So we have conducted a, uh, a econometric tax uh, based on a panel data set of 1,600 transactions. And what we are using is the te technique by uh, Serene Rollins, a uh, hedonic price model, and we control all the actual bills, and what we find, this is the major findings. We find under the both uh, legal institutions, the lemon are over overpriced. Uh, when the let the seller be well principle prevails, the, uh, the lemon was uh, overpriced for 7%. While in the secondary market, uh, where the let the buyer be well principle prevails, they have 10% uh, uh, overpriced. So which is actually the different, uh, the price difference between lemon and non lemons. So the result is that, sim simply speaking, uh, lemon are less overpriced when the property right to information is assigned to the buyers. So we have two possible uh, explanations. The first one, we think that the housing developer deliberately to do so because uh, uh, by giving this 3% of standable discount to the buyer, that will encourage the uh, buyer uh, to flip the lemon uh, in the secondary market. That will discharge their liability according to the uh, property uh, doctrine. Another possible reason is uh, uh, because of the uh, uh, rule of liabilities. Um, we have uh, construct an economic model and showing that uh, actually the pricing of the lemon would depend on the perceived chance of winning if there a wise lawsuit. So if uh, uh, under the seller's beware principle, the seller will have perceived, will perceive a lower chance of uh, winning the court case because the property right to information has been assigned to the uh, buyer. So they uh, tend to be less overpriced the uh, lemon at the outset. And the opposite would be the case for the less the buyer beware principle. So this is uh, our, our explanation. And that's all for this uh, empirical test. And as usual, we have more questions than answer after conducting a study. So um, after uh, we have conducted this study, uh, we go further to uh, uh, query about, uh, inquire, inquire about uh, what are the impacts of different legal institutions uh, to market transactions. So there has been a lot of uh, scholar, legal scholar and economists uh, who have attempted uh, these questions. And we also get that uh, through these uh, empirical uh, findings, we are, we, are, we are contributing to this uh, literature. So in general, what we find and what we believe is that under the buyer, uh, let the seller beware principle, the general price uh, uh, of commodities will be higher because uh, there's a compulsory uh, tie-in insurance element and the seller would tend to over invest on the instruction or disclaimer and so forth and so on. And the search cost for the uh, buyer uh, would be lower because uh, they, they tend to uh, uh, um, uh, 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 do less searching for the product because uh, they would rest on uh, the, uh, the seller. And uh, what we have found in our empirical, in, in our empirical test is that uh, under the let the buyer beware principle, uh, the lemon premium will be lower. While to compare, under the let the buyer beware principle, the general price level of commodity will be lower uh, because uh, there's, uh, uh, the seller tends less to invest on this uh, insurance element and also the, the disclaimer and instruction and so forth and so on. Uh, however, the search costs uh, for the uh, buyer uh, will be higher because now they, 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 are, they, they are themselves liable for any, any uh, product of uh, inferior quality or defects. And according to our empirical test, uh, the lemon premium will be higher uh, under this uh, let the buyer beware uh, principle. And you can think of uh, other, other, other legal institutions like uh, the strict liability. 
uh, where the seller remains uh, liable, uh, even if the lemon is being flipped. So under this situation, perhaps uh, you will find the lemon principle could, could be zero. However, the general commodity price would be very, very high in, in such a uh, uh, society. So this is a conference about coals. So uh, we want to draw some um, uh, insights from uh, coals paper uh, uh, in, uh, written in 1960. So uh, he suggests, uh, in respective to whom the property rights is assigned to, efficient resources allocation would come about through this uh, costless uh, negotiations. So uh, in theory, uh, under these uh, conditions, or uh, under this uh, uh, theorem, the let the buyer or seller beware principle could be uh, symmetrical. So if there's a freedom of uh, contract, actually seller can give away a warranty under the let the uh, buyer beware principle, uh, while the buyer can grant waiver under this uh, let the seller uh, beware principle. So in theory, uh, these uh, two uh, liability rules uh, can be symmetrical. However, has been correctly pointed out this morning by Professor Smith and uh, tomorrow by Professor Demsett, I read his paper, uh, that actually Professor Coase is interested in the world of positive con transaction costs. That would hinder that, uh, that uh, costless, uh, costless negotiation and freedom of contract and so forth and so on. So what is uh, fascinating uh, a young scholar in the far East is uh, uh, are those uh, new institutions uh, emerge uh, under this uh, positive transition cost regime uh, in order to tackle with this uh, lemon problem. So as you know, there's some uh, well um, uh, established scheme in the US uh, like, uh, like uh, this uh, uh, warranty program or mandatory information disclosure uh, program and so forth and so on has been successfully conducted so, uh, so we are very, we are fascinating to study about how this new institution uh, will emerge in order to tackle with uh, all these problems. 49 years ago, Professor Coase, when he wrote his uh, paper on social costs, he drew a lot of examples and references in the real estate market. He said, economists list to study the broker, the restrictive covenants, large scale real estate development company, governmental zoning and other regulatory activities. So 49 years later, uh, we wish by doing this uh, de facto uh, empirical study in the real estate market would have some de jure uh, contribution to the field of law economics and new institutional economics. So thank you. Actions, that's how I got these great pictures of Ronald with lemon. <laughs> Okay, we have uh, time for some questions. Um, uh, you can ask anyone on the panel, including Doug or me. Um, so please. Yes, please. Thank you for the questions. So this is uh, uh, actually what I refer to the new institutions. Uh, that reputation uh, does solve a lot of problem. That uh, so, uh, the developer in Hong Kong, they, they, they are competitive. And they also try to uh, make better quality. And they pay a lot of attention, attention uh, for building up their brain, brain name and products. So that also will solve a part of the problem, but, but not all, yeah, given, given, given the setting. Um, I would say uh, it would pay them to uh, to to invest on those, but uh, whether it is uh, over investment, uh, we we the empirical test uh, in fact cannot answer uh, this question. But that 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 can be one 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 of the concerns. Big cities in developing countries 
hugely uh, demand for, for real estate, and therefore the uh, so in the in the primary market you will see that the price difference between the quality housing and the the real uh, and the levels won't be as much big as in a more mature market, for example, in this country. And so, is that possible for for your study? Because you only draw, you concentrate on the study of Hong Kong and during that period. My understanding that it, there is a huge flood of investment from the mainland China into Hong Kong to the to the real estate market. So, could that affect the findings of your study? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I do think uh, um, to which uh, uh, to develop a better market like uh, the one you have uh, in this country compared with the, those uh, developing countries, it, it will take a long time to develop those uh, what I call good or efficient uh, institutions. So uh, in the U.S. you have a lot of programs, uh, not only in the real estate market but also other products like uh, sec uh, second-hand car. So you have many new institutions developed in order to protect the consumer interest, and you have a discussion debate about whether these uh, strict liability rules or whether the product liability rules should be extended to certain type of uh, commodities. So you have the refund scheme, which is uh, I'm really, really fascinated when the first time when I came to the US, I find you can actually return any product to the train shop uh, if you do not like it, which is uh, not possible in Hong Kong or in China. So I think that these are a lot of uh, new institutions, they emerge, it is because uh, they want to tackle with the, uh, uh, a part of the reason is that uh, they would tackle with uh, this uh, uh, lemons problem. So uh, I would say in, in Hong Kong and in China, uh, yes, uh, you're right that we, are, we, we have a massive uh, demand on a real estate product. Uh, but it would take some time for us uh, to develop uh, those uh, institutions that is so robust and can safeguard the interests of the consumer, like the one you have here in the U.S. Yes, please. I have a question for uh, Sebastian. Um, so you're, you currently focus on the income of individuals, um, and you talk about urban environments. Um, but with rural environments, uh, in particular rainforests, I'm looking at, let's say, Guatemala, where when they try to land to individuals, there's a, with these large tracts of land, there's enforcement issues where other people in the community are going through the rainforest and taking the lumber or taking the produce. Um, and there's intergenerational issues where these people then, because they're all stealing from another spot of land, aren't really, they're racing to the bottom, they're not really concerned about the next generation. So they instead done titles for communities and having community-based land management. Um, do you see well-defined property rights for communities as a viable solution there? Or do you still see the long run taking individual type of land? I, I, I think, um, again, uh, um, Property rights serve several purposes. So in my in my in my solve the problem of investment, but certainly it won't it, it won't uh, stimulate uh, exchange. Uh, so so that I think will be the the take up of what I say regarding uh, your question. Um, 
a professional to buy is a business a mobile operator. A business that becomes operators in China is profit of as almost 52% of total industry, total operation. But the board just work of 50, 50 uh, manufacturers in manufacturing sector. So, this is the first one. The second profit does uh, to the science of the industry. Actually, the, uh, the manufacturing uh, sector contributes to single percent of GDP of China, but the operation, operation sector just contributes 1.8% of GDP. If the government just contains, if the state fits, I mean, of the pattern of the, of the, uh, of, of the, 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 the sector, the government should contain the manufacturing sector, not their operation sector. That the, uh, put it against the other state. Yeah, the, the second point. The third, in terms of employment side, employment side and capitalization, and capitalization, actually the size of the manufacturing is much bigger than operation sector. sector. So I think why to move back has not has so uh, uh, the probably uh, uh, margin of the China mobile is so big. But but the uh, conservation of manufacturing sector is smaller. It's because that from the very beginning the operation sector is less competitive, uh, less active. Actually, in the past, it just have two operators. Even amongst two operators, China Mobile is actually dominate industry. Uh, dominate industry. It's a it's a uh, it's not a subscriber. It's almost. Uh, uh, almost uh, six times than than is a rival of China. China. So it's a, uh, the front margin is a is a is a third from the I mean basically very small upgrade of this sector. So it's a upgrade. Actually, if you if you operate in this way, uh, uh, typical innovation drugs conflicting of the of the of the government government as an individual find not the business. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, question and uh, advice. Um, one question is: uh, two, yes, there are only two service operators in China, and uh, the one I presented, uh, China Mobile, is the largest one, and uh, the, the other one is China Unico. Unico. It, it is smaller, but uh, its its uh, size or its profit is um, about one third of the of the China Mobile. No. Yeah, it's, it's a no, no. Actually, yeah, China Mobile. I think we we yeah, I think we should we should move on. Uh, maybe you two can find this out later. <laughs> So this is for Sebastian. Uh, he, uh, I'm Mike Schill, uh, and uh, soon to be dean of this law school. Um, the uh, the uh, I was I was interested in the collateral effect or the lack of collateral effect that you found is uh, by that I, I what you mean is, is debt uh, secured by the property. Um, is that due to a hypothesis about why you're not finding the effect? Is it Related to say cultural reasons with respect to debt and property in these areas, or is it perhaps primitive nature of the credit markets that they just don't exist, or the some legal issue with regard to the ability to foreclose on on secure property rights? Uh, what would be the reason why you don't find that hypothesized effect? Right. I mean, the the reasons will be exactly the three you mentioned. Uh, so the question is, is more, or, or to make progress, the question will be, do we have any experiment that in which two of the three dimensions you mentioned were satisfied and one not, or, or so? And unfortunately, we, we know none of the studies got to have that, that the possibility of testing that. So, so I, I think it's all speculative. In, in my paper, basically, 
what I look into detail is, is how the credit markets for the poor work. Um, and so it's not, it's not only, uh, so, so, so basically uh, I think one of the most binding constraints before getting to the collateral is that most of the people works in the informal labor market. So they were not gonna be able to uh, demonstrate earnings and they're not gonna qualify even if the collateral put their wealth above a threshold at which the uh, existing supply of credit will be interesting to lend, okay? But, but then, as I, that's, I, I just touched it in, in the talk because it will, be, it will take time. If, they, if you're looking at one small intervention like the one I'm looking, you don't expect supply responses, but if you're looking at one uh, like the Peruvian uh, intervention where more than a million households received title over a very short period of time, you might see entry into this uh, sort of entry of suppliers tailoring credit to uh, this uh, specific group, even if they, they are uh, not formal. It, it might still be profitable to do that. And, and there's, no, there's no effect either there. So, but, but I cannot say if that there is only one constraint because no, no study that I'm, I know uh, it was able to test that. This, this collateral effect is quite interesting because I was at a conference um, a week before I came here that was organized by uh, the Center for International Private Enterprises and uh, the first act was to honor Hernando de Soto with some kind of big award who of course is the primary proponent of the idea that land titling leads to this collateral effect and yet it seems to be pretty robust in all of the studies that Sebastian summarized uh, that there was no collateral effect. So somehow it lives on in, uh, in mythology even though we, we haven't been able to find any robust empirical evidence for it. Yes, yeah, um, I think this is for Sebastian too. It has to do about the cost effectiveness of title devices. I guess the gist of the study that we had is that in the urban environment it seems to work better than it does in the rural environment where you don't know what it's cost effective. And I'm just curious as to how it is that you define the cost that determines whether or not this thing is going to be effective. Um, is this the kind of situation where you're going to have to go on the ground, plot by plot, with illiterate people, or if somebody takes a Google map from above, figure out what the probabilities would be, put it in some kind of I was confident that it was not cost effective. I think what I say is that the one study in, in rural areas that explicitly took the time to do the exercise of just contrasting, let's say, for example, you can do it in several ways, but one way they did it is, well, they estimate how much the land value increased when its title contrasted to untitled uh, pieces of land. And, and so they find some effects. And then the, the, the price of, of land increased by, by a hectare, okay? So the, uh, assuming, which is, is a fairly uh, reasonable assumption that the cost of titling is, is a fixed cost, uh, well, they, sh they find the cutoff point, right? At what point the size of the plot will pay given the increase in price uh, compared to the cost, and they find that the cutoff point, I think it was six hectares, which what? six hectares, uh, and which for, at least for Madagascar and from most of South Saharan Africa is a big piece of plot, and that's what I say. And then in Vietnam, it's, uh, that was not what they find. They find that it was more cost effective. So the only thing I say, well, there's a bunch of studies that they don't do that, so it will be nice in, in, in our paper, if we can sort of do a similar exercise uh, in a meta-analysis way to have more confidence of whether it is a strong result or is something coming from Madagascar. Ex 
exactly what, what this summary of the literature shows you is that in, in urban area, in rural areas, as I say, land is used as an input to production. So because in all papers you find effects on, on investment uh, uh, that is always en enhancing productivity, you, f you can say that in, in rural areas you, there is uh, an effect of, of improving the land property rights on earnings. Then there's the question of whether it's still that pays off or not. But in, in, instead, when, once you move to um, urban areas, this land is not used as an input of production. So he, to find an effect, you first has to find an effect on access to credit, or it has to be that households are, are at, such a, at, at such a margin where basically they are using all the labor they have to to go to the market and protect the property. So once you reduce the uh, demand from households of protection, they can substitute labor. But, and, and then in Peru, they, they seem to find that. But I don't find that in Argentina. So it's still, I, I can't say we, we have a lot of evidence to be conclusive in that much. Because it's true that the Actually, they might increase their earnings uh, quite a bit because the wage differential from Finnish high school uh, is of the order of 40%. So, but they are not in the market yet. Yeah, so, so simply, it's just a matter of time. You know? Yeah. Because, you know, if you have a big investment, you, know, you might at least be able to expand that you will bring more in the future. Yeah, that, that's, How nice that? yeah that's, a, that's a reasonable conclusion from from my paper, one that I reach in the paper. Uh, I just, it's, uh, I don't know, I don't want to oversell my, my paper in this overview of the literature. One of the uh, uh, studies of Sebastian's that we supported was to identify all the, uh, the uh, individuals who were getting, the young people, the, the children who were getting more education and also their families and have a way to come back and do a subsequent study of whether there was an earnings earnings effect in the future. Uh, so that would probably answer your question, but it'll take a while to get those results. Yes, please. Um, this week, I don't care. I'm not a big fan of this study. And it's been mentioned, but I think it's worth re-emphasizing. In the short run, Sebastian's results show a substantial fall in uh, adolescent fertility. So that was a relatively short-term effect. And the uh, long-term effect on children's education is gigantic. So while the social effect doesn't seem to be coming through, this is a surprising and very important uh, task. Sorry. Oh, sorry. You can see. Uh, this is a uh, Bob Cooter from Berkeley. Uh, the titling process is a matter of quieting disputes over property. Uh, and what that means is that Somebody who thinks he has a right to the land gets it, and somebody who thinks he has a right to the land doesn't get it. That's what it means to end a dispute. Uh, and I was wondering if you could say something about how that's handled. Uh, I'm particularly interested in this because I observed some land titling survey work in Guinea, and uh, the uh, disputes among people there were so uh, long-standing that the titling was a, a very simple matter relative to resolve the underlying disputes. And I wonder if you could say something about that, uh, how that dispute resolution process relates to securing property rights. I, 
can say from my study, I, I'm not sure I can sort of give you an overview of how it's resolved everywhere in the world. I think Gary might, might know much, much more than me about that. Uh, in, 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 in this uh, urban, urban areas, which was the case in, in Lima and also in, in the whole Peru and, and in Buenos Aires, I don't think uh, the, the issues were or led to that kind of conflict. Basically, squatters squat, tend to squat the area. It might, it might belong to the government or to, to or local governments, and then they don't try to evict the people and they stay there. So just to give you an example, in the very, very south of Argentina, there is a, 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 now a province that used to be a, a federal land, okay? And so they promoted industrialization at some point. So a lot of workers from the poor north migrated there, and they work there. All of them reside in titles, in pieces of land that are untitled. And, but it belongs to, to the local government, and so far no one is, feels uncertainty about eviction. Still, it might affect exchange, but still, but, but it doesn't affect eviction. So, so in, in the particular case I, I study, basically they squatted the land, they, they want, the, the, the government tried to evict them, actually, for, for six months. It's, uh, it's, it's, but it's not really, it, I mean, I can talk about that, but, but it, there's nothing to generalize from this, this episode. So what happened is that there was a military government, they tried to evict them, uh, then uh, they resisted, uh, then there was a rape, there was accusations that was one of the police that raped someone living there, so then the government has to retreat, then they enter into a war with the Falklands, and then the government changed. And, and, and then there was uh, elections, and the, new, and, and the squatters said, well, we want, we want the land, and, 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 and the government and the candidates running for president, all, all of them promised that they were titling the land, but then w once in government, they figure out that it didn't belong to the government, so they have to go through, through a law to expropriate that, and then some owners decided to surrender the land, and some owners decided to go to a court and have a better luck, which they didn't. Uh, um, and what determines the decision of the owner uh, is something we, we also studied, tracking the cases through the courts of law for, for many years, and, and basically it's not related to land quality or to the offer that the government did. They, they are equal, and it's an argument that the uh, government lawyers met repeatedly for the arguing that it was fair, that it was all based on the previous fiscal valuation of the land that is used for tax purposes. And, and so it seems that the, basically the, own, the people that did not surrender the lands was the groups, uh, the, the owners that have very large groups of owners. So that somehow internal disagreement uh, preclude them from surrendering the land. And that was all that happened. John. Uh, John, uh, one of the things that bothers me about the land titling literature is that they're not distinguishing between three types of disputes about the title. So one would be the case in which both parties, or say all the parties involved, it's all private property, but there's real ambiguity about the title, there's very there's a non formal title the system. So there is an issue of what is the great title system that is approved. The second one would be a case in which you have squatters squatting on privately owned land and not being evicted. And so there's a reality that de facto they own the land, but they can't dispose of it. So it's a matter of creating title to land due to an ownership that's de facto worse to be with. And in the third case, which is the one that's most common, that, that I see in a lot of these cases, is public land that's not owned and no squatters. And so in the, the case of the DeSoto story, tightly, when you look at effect of tightly, how much of the effect, whenever it's positive, is the tightly effect or how much is the effect of transferring public land to private land? And the reason I say that is that in that case, you may be looking at two different effects. If you imagine a counterfactual, but imagine that the title itself is not very important. The important thing is to transfer the framework, which will mostly show that enclosures um, raised the value of property of common lands in England in the 18th century. But what Alan pointed out, that's because some of the transfers were redistribution, because they, they, they appropriated some of the commons rights of people who are not official owners. And by assigning ownership to a subgroup of people who had access to common land, they were essentially stealing or redistributing rights from one group to another. And therefore, they, they must have exaggerated the value of enclosures to this property. And I wonder if it's the same thing. You may be exaggerating the value of title because you're confusing value of title with the transfer of public and private rights. Your point at all.
course, I, I didn't have much time, but when I say it all depends on the status quo, it relates to the points you made, right? It relates to how much. Then we get closer to the mic. It, it depends on how much the 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 counterfactual of the title. What's exactly the counterfactual of the title? So, of course, one thing is to say, well, you know, I want to answer all these questions. The other is to really have in each study the possibility of then separating one effect from the other. There's a second point which I think is more important in the question that you made, which is how much of this is a wealth effect, right? So again, that's going to be case by case. And, and in, in, in Sub-Saharan South, South Africa, most of the people think that the wealth effect will go in the other direction. And, and in the sense that basically the, 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 the status quo property rights, in, in a sense, are, are redistributing compared to what will be the outcome if you privatize and, or, or legalize land. But go, going concretely in, in our study, we, we, we pay attention to that. Um, um, we look at the uh, consumption of durable goods. And, and there was no difference. So of course you can always say, well, this guy has such a utility function that they first gonna, you know, they're not gonna change the consumption of durables if they have a wealth effect. But under normal behavior, you will expect that if there was a large wealth transfer, uh, you will observe not only that they invest more in the house, but they also they have more durable goods. And, and we, did, we didn't have, uh, we didn't find that. But, but, but you cannot generalize that, right? You can imagine cases where, I mean, yeah, there is redistribution all the time, in any time the governments do things, so, so it might happen in many cases. Okay, we, we're running out of time, and I'm terribly fearful of our uh, master of ceremonies who's signaling me. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably had somebody back here with a hook. Uh, let me thank you all very much for your attention and uh, on behalf of the Ronald Coase Institute as well as the organizers. Thank you.